It has been a hard day's night. And I have been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should be sleeping like a log. But when I get home to you, I find the things that you do will make me feel all right. If this video is well received, we could be very well looking at a new series where I branch out into classical literature. As I took English literature for A-level and studied some classics from my undergrad course, I've always had a particular fondness for them, even if some of them are hard to get through. In this format, I'd be looking at a piece of literature that has tons of adaptations and then do my hot takes on some of them. Unlike my rankings for historical figures where I tried to track down every single one that can reasonably be found, I'm going to have to set a limit to some of these. Shall we say 10? All right, just wake me up. The main rule is the piece has to follow similar beats to the original source material. I say this because there are only a few adaptations of the actual Dracula novel, but there are hundreds of uses of the vampire Dracula all over pop culture. But if there's a piece that's a follow-up to the adaptation, I might look at that as well. I think that's fair enough, don't you? Richard III is a play that has dominated the last Plantagenet King's legacy. A while ago, I was trying to list all the interpretations of Henry VII and Edward VI, and I realised there are a lot of adaptations of Richard III and The Prince and the Pauper that would dominate the focus, so I have no choice but to separate the Shakespeare play from the real-life king if I'm to do him justice. There are two films that take influence from the play, both called The Tower of London, and both have Vincent Price in them. However, they don't include the Shakespearean dialogue, and are so much their own thing that they'll be included in the rankings list. The anime Requiem of the Rose King likewise uses a mix of Shakespeare and real history to tell its story, so it will also be saved for the rankings. I would prefer to use those that stick to the language from the play, or pick it apart in an academic or humorous manner. And of course, because there's a limit, there will be a few versions that get missed out. These are the ones that are either so famous I have to include them, or ones that I have a personal connection to. For adaptations that include Henry VI, I will also talk about how Richard is presented in those plays. Shakespeare's history plays based on the Wars of the Roses are amongst his earliest works. The play was preceded by all three parts of Henry VI, which shows the end of the Hundred Years' War right up until Henry VI murder by Richard. The earliest Richard III is believed to have come out is 1592. Henry VI Part Three was well received by audiences. In the same year that it premiered, Robert Greene published a pamphlet lampooning Shakespeare called A Groat's Worth of Wit, a groat being the lowest form of currency at the time. He referred to the bard as an upstart crow, and this is me doing my best Mark Heap impression here, an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that this tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you, and being as absolute Johannes Factotum, in his own conceit, the only shake scene in a country. Good day. Robert Greene was quite jealous of Shakespeare's talent. While the Bard was writing Richard as a follow-up to Henry VI, he was also working on his grimmest of tragical plays, Titus Andronicus. The less said about that play, the better. Nya, 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 nya. I made you eat your parents. Nya, 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 nya. You are likely aware that many, if not all, Shakespearean histories were under the scrutiny of the Tudors, much like how I am under the scrutiny of my cat who is climbing up my chest as we speak. There was no freedom of expression to criticise or even ridicule the ruling monarch, lest it be used as ammo to rally an uprising against them. Elizabeth I greatly identified with Richard II, a play which the Earl of Essex had staged before his failed rebellion. He did not succeed and the Lord Chamberlain's men distanced themselves from Essex. Shakespeare took sources from historians Edward Hall and Raphael Holinshed, who had based their works on the writings of Polydor Virgil and Sir Thomas More, who got their sources from John Rouse's Historia Regnum Angli, and Bishop John Morton, who was made Henry VII Archbishop of Canterbury and had been exiled under Richard, so was hardly going to be unbiased against him. Under no circumstances could Richard be shown in a positive light, 
Henry VII's claim to the throne by right of conquest had to be supported by any means possible. This has resulted in Richard becoming a corrupt schemer whose inner ugliness is reflected through his appearance with his hunched back, withered arm and club foot. Some depictions include some or all of his deformities, but they always keep the hunch. The play and the Henriad overall is Shakespeare's demonstration of a Greek tragedy brought into the medium of early modern theatre, with the use of ghosts and multiple characters taking the role of the Greek chorus. Greek Rather than following a virtuous hero, this Richard III has popularised the idea of the anti-hero, where the audience is aware of their true intentions and can only watch as he manipulates events to his gain. Richard first appears in Act 5, Scene 1 of Henry VI, Part 2. Preceding this, his father York has become a war hero by capturing and executing Joan of Arc, before he decided to use his claim to the throne to overthrow the weak Henry VI in the aftermath of the Duke of Gloucester's murder. Earlier in the play, the Duchess of Gloucester worked with sorcerers to uncover a prophecy that Gloucester would be king. Richard kills the Duke of Somerset outside of a tavern. They head to London, where York lays claim to the throne. Richard already has his eyes on the throne, as he compels his father to break his oath and just take the throne anyway, moments before Queen Margaret retaliates and kills York. Before they learn of their father and brother's deaths, Edward, George and Richard have a vision of three sons coming together, thinking that this must apply to them and their destiny to become a uniting force in England. While his brothers mourn their father, Richard is hell-bent on revenge. After the battle, he is given the Dukedom of Gloucester, although Richard is reluctant to take the title, given that the last one was brutally murdered. Meanwhile, George is made Duke of Clarence. When they defeat Queen Margaret and Prince Edward at Dukesbury, all three brothers stab the prince to death in front of his mother. While the prince is still bleeding out, Richard takes it upon himself to ride back to London and murder King Henry in cold blood. In Richard III, our titular king schemes his way into power by framing Clarence for treason, which causes Edward to die from grief. He marries Anne Neville through emotional blackmail, but admits he won't keep her long. With the help of the Duke of Buckingham, they seize and murder Lord Rivers and Lord Grey, and arrange to imprison Edward's sons in the Tower of London. Lord Hastings refuses to support Richard's power grab, so Richard manipulates Hastings into saying something treasonous so he can be beheaded. Afterwards, Buckingham and Catesby convince the Lord Mayor to support Richard's claim to the throne. Immediately after he has been crowned, Richard decides to murder the princes, but Buckingham's hesitation puts him on Richard's list. The princes and Anne Neville die off screen while Richard plots to marry Princess Elizabeth. Buckingham is caught and executed while Richmond lands in England. The night before the Battle of Bosworth, Richard is visited by the ghosts of all his victims, including Prince Edward and Henry VI. Richard confronts his isolation. In the battle, he is unhorsed and cries, My kingdom for a horse! before Richmond kills him. Afterwards, a triumphant Richmond proclaims peace in the realm. I just want to state that this is not an official rankings list, and these adaptations are not being listed in any particular order. I am just listing the Richard III's that mean the most to me, and, I think, carry the most influence in broader pop culture. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. I had to start with this one. Sir Laurence Olivier is probably the biggest Shakespeare nerd ever to have lived, Rivaled closely by Kenneth Branagh. I'm surprised that I don't have a rendition by Branagh on this list. This is one of the three Shakespearean adaptations that Olivier both directed and starred in, the other two being Hamlet in 1948, for which he earned his only Oscar, and Henry V in 1944. It is seen as the definitive adaptation of Richard III, which others tend to take influence from. The opening of the film, rather than starting with dialogue from the play, uses dialogue from the end of Henry VI Part Three, in order to set up the characters who will be affected by Richard's plotting. Sound drums and trumpets, farewell, Sir Annoy, for here I hope begins our lasting joy. <laughs> Richard is ingeniously revealed, and the merry court makes a stark contrast to the morose duke. Olivier had played Richard on stage before to critical praise. He based his look on Jed Harris, who was the most loathsome man he'd ever met. 
I'm sure his appearance is familiar to you, as it is practically identical to Lord Farquaad in Shrek. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Unlike Kenneth Branagh, however, Olivier was not averse to manipulating the text to suit his adaptation. He moved scenes around, split them up, and even omitted characters. If you are going to cut a Shakespeare play, there is only one thing to do. Lift out scenes. If you cut the lines down merely to keep all the characters in, you end up with a mass of short ends. This is one of the problems with Richard III. To start with, it's a very long play. It's not until the little princes come on that the story forms a nice river sweep, going swiftly to its conclusion from about halfway through the play. The first part up until that moment is an absolute delta of plot and presupposed foreknowledge of events. After all, Richard III forms the last part of a cycle of four plays. To be fair, many adaptations omit Queen Margaret. Act 1, Scene 2 is split up, so Richard woos Anne over a longer span of time, as if showing he wore her down. Clarence's arrest is put between the two scenes. Olivier's natural charm works its way into Richard's character, where he enthralls and seduces Anne, much more overtly. Then again, if it is Laurence Olivier hitting on you, why wouldn't you fall for him? For me, it's the voice. Always the bloody voice. Either you go to America with Mrs. Van Hopper, or you come home to Mandalay with me. You mean you want a secretary or something? I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. Olivier seems to understand that the language of theatre and the language of cinema are two different beings. Therefore, not every single line of iambic pentameter needs to be included, and can just as easily be shown through visuals. The film does not end with Henry Tudor's final dialogue. The final line is Richard's My Kingdom for a Horse. Afterwards, he is sworn by Stanley's men before he dies of his injuries, tied to a horse and taken away before Stanley finds the crown. Above all, you can tell that this film was a labour of love by Olivier. Because he's having fun making it, you're having fun watching it. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Sometimes I wonder how the real Richard would react if he saw these depictions. Maybe these famous figures gather around a giant TV in the afterlife. If so, Richard must have a real bone to pick with Benedict Cumberbatch. The dude read a poem at his funeral and then proceeded to star in the adaptation of the play that has defamed him. I will be very lucky if I can avoid a copyright claim from the BBC in this video because there is nothing the Beeb likes more than a Shakespeare adaptation. The ambition of the Hollow Crown was to show all the history plays, with the exception of King John and Henry VIII, in their original setting bringing with them the best British actors available at the time. The Hollow Crown probably takes the biggest liberties with source material than any other adaptation in this video. Characters are omitted or switched around, and whole subplots are dumped in favour of a more flowing narrative. It's probably not a good idea to use this series as your introduction to Henry VI, because I was quite lost when I watched it. They also add little bits of dialogue here and there to make the characters sound a little bit more human such as calling out each other's names. Margaret saying she is the queen while in prison. Listen to me. I am the queen. And Joan of Arc pleading for her life while she's been taken to the stake. In this version, Richard does not kill the Duke of Somerset, and the series uses its adaptation of Henry VI Part Three to give him more of an arc where he starts off as a wide-eyed innocent who is only sent for after the Battle of St Albans, so he can join his father and brothers in entering Westminster. He isn't even armed, and is only handed an axe by Warwick as if to hold it for him. During Margaret's attack on York's home, Richard and Edmund hide from the soldiers, and he witnesses his brother being murdered in front of him, after which he becomes the bloodthirsty murderer that we all recognise. It's as if the series is telling us that Richard wasn't always evil, the Wars of the Roses changed him, and he accepted what a violent world he lived in, because he didn't want to die begging for his life like Edmund. With his attractive and trusting face, it is very easy to understand why people would believe his lies. The series shows the extent of Richard's deformities, and the quality of special effects they have, when he delivers his opening monologue shirtless. I kind of like the imagery of that, as though he is revealing his true self with no layers and literally puts on his disguise by covering himself with a shirt and doublet. Although much of Henry VI is abridged, Richard III is mostly faithful to its source material, and even includes Margaret, 
who is one of the main players throughout the season. Margaret is so prominent that she leads the dream sequence where most of the ghosts are included, save for Edward of Westminster in Hastings. I'm not overly crazy about the hollow crown depiction, as a lot of the script has been tossed out to get a satisfactory timeline. I know this was made to directly compete with Game of Thrones, as much of A Song of Ice and Fire is directly lifted from the Wars of the Roses. At the very least, we could have seen more of Lord Talbot, the badass commander whom York and Somerset must avenge at the end of Henry VI Part One. I can tell the real intention was to set up the backdrop as quickly as possible in order to get to Richard. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. In the late 70s and early 80s, the BBC endeavoured to adapt every single play for the screen. Every single one, sir? Every single one, sir! We can thank Cedric Messina for this. The project spanned seven seasons, with Henry VI and Richard III taking up most of season five. Throughout the plays, many actors are used for multiple roles, as if they're one big company recycling the actors. Bernard Hill, for example, predominantly plays Richard of York, but he is also a gunner at the Siege of Orléans, and later one of Clarence's assassins. I didn't fully realise this at first because I watched the plays out of order. I began with Richard III, and then Henry VI Part Three, and then watched Henry VI Part One, where Ron Cook played a few minor roles, and I was a bit confused because I thought, hang on a second, you're not supposed to show up yet. Ron Cook, of course, plays Richard himself. While Richard III sounds well enough on its own, it really does help to watch all the way from the beginning, especially given the overall setting of the plays. Most of the other plays are filmed like movies, while others reuse the same sets. The Wars of the Roses plays all take place on the same set, where the fourth wall is noticeably absent. The set is built to resemble an adventure playground that starts off brightly coloured and gets dingier throughout each passing play. This saps any sense of grandiosity or valour from the Wars of the Roses itself, and breaks it down to its chaotic and bloody foundations. Because of the setting, use of anachronisms are also present, especially in the armour for the battle scenes, which seem better suited to give the actors full mobility. Richard III wears a metal leg brace, which would look more at home on a 20th century polio survivor. The titles of each play are diegetically worked into the set. The first two parts of Henry VI are displayed on banners, as these are two battle-heavy plays, and still hold an air of chivalry and glory behind them. Part 3 is displayed as a shroud, covering a mass of corpses to represent the ugliness and bloodshed of war. Richard III has Cook emerge onto an empty stage, separated from the mirth of the court, and write the play's title in chalk. My interpretation, given the context of the previous play, where he outright states his wish to be king, is this is him beginning to act on his desires. This version is probably the most faithful to its source material by including almost every line of dialogue. Only 72 lines have been cut out of the total 3,887. This makes it the longest play of the Shakespeare collection, reaching almost four hours in length. If you buy the DVD, it is split onto two discs and both halves have intermissions. The final shot of the play did evoke some controversy as it depicts Queen Margaret cackling maniacally while sitting on top of a mountain of corpses made up of most of the actors who have been in the last four plays. Meanwhile, she cradles Richard's now shirtless and bloody body. It was called a blasphemous pieta, a pieta being a piece of religious art where the Virgin Mary cradles Jesus' body after the crucifixion. The intention behind this image was to show the bloodshed that has come before, that cannot be ignored. There was no deeper meaning behind all this violence. It doesn't mean the bloodshed will ever stop. As for Ron Cook's portrayal of Richard, he gives a more emotionally unstable element to this character, who is usually so reserved. Going back to the playground squabble theme that the series perpetuates, Cook's Richard is like that one kid who has tried to get everyone to play by the rules, until he ultimately snaps and makes his own rules. It doesn't feel as though Richard is hiding his true self under a facade that only the audience is privy to. It does help that we've had the previous plays to build on his character as well. Cook, like many of the Richards shown here, is a veteran of many Shakespearean works on stage. He has also played Thomas Cromwell in the 2003 Other Berlin Girl film, Mr Magpie in the Doctor Who episode The Idiot's Lantern, and Napoleon Bonaparte in Sharp. This guy's had a pretty impressive career. Now is the winter of our discontent. May, glorious summer. By this son of York. Now 
Is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer? Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Now this film is one of the reasons why I had to bend the rules for what adaptations to include, because I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it. Al Pacino is considered by cinephiles as one of the greatest actors of all time, so it is such a contrast in this film to see him basically be that meme from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia for the best part of two hours. Pacino directed and starred in this as both himself and Richard III. The modern day segments surround Pacino travelling through New York, London and Stratford, trying to get to the heart of Shakespeare and Richard. Where was William Shakespeare born? There's the bed of birth. You gotta be kidding. I was expecting to have an epiphany, an outpouring of, uh, of the soul upon seeing... Well, why don't you go out and come back the, uh, again? If you're, if, Shakespeare was if born you're really an actor, then. you can come back and uh, have an epiphany. I, no, I, I'm, I'm... He interviews academics, the people on the street, and famous actors on how Shakespeare has affected their lives. Unsurprisingly, Kenneth Browner is one of them. The other half of the film is an actual adaptation of Richard III in its medieval setting. Only parts of the play are adapted, however, so it's like you're watching a movie that was never made. The fact that these actors keep their American accents makes me kind of glad that this movie doesn't actually exist. The only reason it wasn't made in full was because Pacino didn't think he could live up to Laurence Olivier's version. Pacino has played Richard on stage before in the 1970s. It makes sense that he would gravitate towards Shakespeare's Richard. There are many parallels between him and Michael Corleone, Pacino's most famous film role. A third son driven by the world around him into becoming a bad guy, whether he wanted to or not. Likewise, his other best-known character, Scarface, mirrors Richard's last stand as the consequences of his actions close in on him. This film took four years to make between film projects. By the time it came to editing, he amassed 80 hours of footage. Hashtag release the Pacino cut. When it came to the final battle, Pacino had no money left to film it. So Michael Mann volunteered some of his film crew from In the Heat. You can tell that Al Pacino is so passionate about Shakespeare, and despite having his own devoted fans and a great legacy, he can't help but be intimidated by the words of the Bard, and wants to understand him as best as possible to do justice to his work. Pacino is a method actor by trade, so you can understand his dedication. What's more, it goes to show that Shakespeare is for everyone. Whether you're a classically trained actor working for the RSC, or a born and bred New Yorker who suffered from substance abuse and homelessness in their formative years, it really does give you a new appreciation of Al Pacino. After silence, what else is there? What's the, what's the line? The rest is silence. The silence is... Whatever I'm saying, I know Shakespeare said it. Mm. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this one. As of writing the script, I only watched it for the first time yesterday. The film is based on a national theatre production where the setting was moved from the 1480s to the 1930s. The overall atmosphere and aesthetic is wonderful. All the main locations are filmed at places in the UK which highlight the imperialist and dystopian elements present within the country. Sometimes I forget that this is what St Pancras looked like before its makeover. The Brighton Pavilion is a minimalist's nightmare, with bright and garish colours to show the ignorant contentment of the royal family that allowed Richard to scheme his way to power. The use of Bankside Power Station as the Tower of London almost gives it a Soviet brutalist ambience. I'll address the elephant in the room and declare that the fascist imagery does make me a little uncomfortable, but maybe that was the point. While the obvious reference to the Third Reich is hard to miss, there was more of an attempt to evoke how easily what happened in Germany could have happened anywhere else. Gary Lineker was right, there I said it. Sir Ian McKellen's look in the film was in reference to known British fascist Oswald Mosley. Nothing on the screen is truly wasted, everything has a purpose. The idea to make the Woodvilles American adds to the idea that they were social climbers, especially given the clear age gap between Elizabeth and Edward. Edward V's costume when he arrives in London is something many of us have seen King Charles wear for ceremony. Above all, you can tell that Ian McKellen is having so much fun with this role. The only reason he didn't direct the film himself is because he wasn't 
comfortable behind the camera, although he did have an executive producer credit. He revels in the violence and unhappiness that he causes, as if everyone is just a puppet to him. The film also takes advantage of the space between verse to develop some characters. For one thing, Anne Neville is shown descending into drug abuse, first with pills but later with heroin, to handle the emotional neglect she feels under Richard. Richard seems aware of his wife's habits, and rather than actually have her killed, he simply leaves her to descend further until she overdoses. A murder by omission, if you will. Some of the more supernatural elements are removed. Though we are privy to Richard's every thought, we never see the dream sequence where he is visited by the ghosts, but can guess that it has happened. You will notice in the final battle that is set in Battersea Power Station, Richard's final words are mixed up. His my kingdom for a horse is in reference to his jeep when it stalls, and the driver is killed. He shoots Tyrrell when he urges Richard to escape. Instead, Richard climbs to the highest point in a clear reference to White Heat, where he decides to go out in a blaze of glory rather than surrender. Let's to it, pal, now. If not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. Richmond lazily shoots him, so it looks as if he won the fight. And he looks up to break the fourth wall, as if the perspective has passed from Richard onto him now. While I do find more of the fascistic elements of the film a little uncomfortable, I still think this is a film worth watching, in order to study how one would put a history play into another time period. Before this film, Sir Ian McKellen had only appeared in a few American-made films, and was mostly a stage actor. Without this film, I believe we would never have gotten his version of Gandalf or Magneto. Amazing how many hits I've had called Henry. Add two Richards and a John, which were spin-offs, and I, I've, <laughs> I've, kind of, I've kind of invented a franchise. <laughs> the, the Henry Universe. This is not a full-on adaptation of Richard III, but in its own way it still counts, because it follows the man who wrote the play. Upstart Crow was a British sitcom set in the late 16th century, centering around William Shakespeare as he finds inspiration for his plays and faces other dangerous elements of Elizabethan England, like Catholic Jesuits, Plague, Robert Greene who doth hate his gutlings, and travelling between his London lodgings and his home in Stratford. Good journey, love. Well, it's, uh, it's funny you should say that, Anne, because uh, you know how up until now I've never, ever had a good journey? Yes. <laughs> well, amazingly, I still haven't. Most episodes have an abridged version of the play, with Shakespeare quoting his current or future words, or stealing the idea from others. Early on in the series, Shakespeare has already written most of his history plays, with Richard III being his most famous. At many points, it is highlighted how historically inaccurate the play is, in order to praise the rule of Queen Elizabeth. The show was created by Ben Elton, another massive Shakespeare nerd, and one of the creators behind Blackadder. It is my belief that these two sitcoms operate within the same universe. Oh, it's um, short for, um, Bob. Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Judge Robert. Please, call me Bob. The series is not afraid of poking fun at Richard III, and how long and boring it can be sometimes. You have the three main actors, Burbage, Condell and Kemp, bring this up a lot, especially Kemp, who thinks they should play it for laughs. Well, uh, for instance, do a scene where everyone's trying really hard not to mention his stoop, but they can't stop himself. Richard's with his knights, and Norfolk goes, oh, fancy a spot of hunch? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I meant lunch. You're not changing a line of my Richard. It's perfect. All four hours of it. And yes, I have gone through all three seasons and all three holiday specials in order to find every reference to Richard III. Rest assured, whenever I get the chance, I will talk about this show. Oh, beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Well, perhaps you're right. Don't want to jump to conclusions. No. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. If I cover a Shakespeare play in the future, expect me to include this series as one of the versions I look at, purely from nostalgia. This half-hour animated adaptation is part of a series of animated retellings of 12 Shakespeare plays. Richard III was the only history play to be featured. Some were done in traditional hand-drawn animation, some were done in stop-motion, and a few others were done in a style that looked like moving sketches or paintings, otherwise known as paint on glass. Richard III was one such play. 
The aim of the series was to introduce children to Shakespeare for the first time, but all the sex and gore are still there. I remember seeing the Romeo and Juliet episode when I was studying the play in year 6 or 5th grade, and watching the Tempest episode in year 9 or 8th grade. Then I watched the rest of the series online. You can find some episodes on YouTube, but not all of them. Like other adaptations, the series used several actors who have worked with Shakespeare before to fill their casts. Brian Cox played Macbeth, Fiona Shaw played Viola, Anton Lesser played King Leontes, and we had Bernard Hill back as Bottom. The voice acting was recorded first in the UK, while the animation was done in Russia. This version of Richard III is voiced by the late Sir Anthony Shear. The art style gives a twisted, grim look to the world of the play, with most of the colour being intrusive yellows and reds, surrounded by the unsettling darkness of the castle interiors. You don't feel safe in this setting. You feel lost. And you're stuck following this corrupt man who laughs over the deaths of those closest to him. Sir Anthony Shear had already played Richard on stage ten years prior to this series, so he was an ideal candidate for the role. He was such a Shakespearean that he was living in Stratford-on-Avon at the time of his death in 2021, after six years of being married to his long-term partner Gregory Doran. He won two Olivier Awards, and also played many other Shakespearean villains, including Macbeth, Shylock and Titus Andronicus. The latter two plays were not adapted into this series for obvious reasons. Even though this version is only half an hour long, as opposed to the four hour long play, I think this really stands out on its own. Leon Garfield, the head writer, claimed that abridging these plays was like painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel onto a postage stamp. Nonetheless, it covers the main beats of the story so well that you are not lost in context. And for once, the use of narration helps summarise what is happening between the scenes that would usually have been played out. Some other episodes take influence from other adaptations. You can tell the Romeo and Juliet episode took influence from the Zeffirelli film, and Hamlet was mostly inspired by the Olivier version. You would have thought Olivier's influence would have reached this one as well. Had this animated Richard been dark-haired, I might have spotted it. But this version is blonde, better to stand out from the dark backdrop. I'm going to say it here. Sir Anthony Shear is probably my favourite Shakespearean Richard, his voice carries such a malevolence in private and charisma in public, and the animators perfectly designed an appearance to suit this voice. I have to at least mention the silent adaptations of the play, as they were the earliest depictions. In total, there were three. The first two were released in 1908 and 1911, with William Rannis and Frank Benson starring as Richard, respectively. These were short films quickly summarising the events of the play, without the iambic pentameter to slow it up. I've seen that the 1908 version has been confused with the 1912 one on IMDb and YouTube, but I have checked, and the 1908 version does not have any surviving footage or images. The 1911 film, on the other hand, is still available to watch, and in pretty good quality too. The film shows a sped up depiction of Henry VI's defeat and Richard making himself clear to the audience by brawling with and killing what seems to be Edward of Westminster. The film continues thus with enthusiastic miming from the actors who demonstrate what is happening. It looks as if it was filmed on a stage as well, given the painted backdrops and sparsely decorated set. The 1912 version starring Frederick Ward as Richard is significantly one of America's first feature films. It was shot in Westchester County, New York. Furthermore, it has the title of being the first feature film based on a Shakespeare play and the oldest American feature film that still survives today. The only existing print was kept by William Buffham and now sits in the Library of Congress. I noticed in the text cards that they misspelled Gloucester, unless that's how Americans spell Gloucester. Either that or it was so the audience could understand how it was meant to be pronounced. A lot of us have said Worcester and Gloucester much to our shame. Like most silent movies, they write the context of a scene before playing it out. One unique aspect is that Richard takes advantage of Edward's ill health in order to get him to sign Clarence's death warrant. The sets are a lot better than the 1911 film, giving a clear distinction between locations and it uses the classic yellow filter for day and blue filter for night. The final battle leaves something to be desired, but seeing as film was very new to people at the time, I'm inclined to let that slide. 
I must admit, I'm still not a huge fan of silent films, but I appreciate their significance and the fact that they were a stepping stone. It's interesting to see how one adapts Shakespeare without using his language. They do this with ballet all the time, but they usually have bombastic music to back that up. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Yes, that's right. Bilbo Baggins played Richard III. If there are two things I keep cycling back to in covering Richard III, both the play and the person, they're Lord of the Rings and Sherlock Holmes. The latter of which you'll understand when I get to the next video. The series almost feels like the original Hollow Crown, with much less abridging. It has a cast full of classically trained actors and oh my god 23 year old David Warner. I'm grateful to Mr Conradian who uploaded the series onto YouTube from its VHS release. Much like with The Hollow Crown, Richard does not appear when the text says he does, and the endings of part 2 and 3 blend seamlessly into one another in the same episode. He first appears before York is killed at Wakefield, and Richard kills Somerset in said battle. Similarly, Henry VI part 3 and Richard III also flow into each other in the same episode. A fun fact about the guy playing Edward IV in this series, Roy de Tris, he was the narrator for all of the A Song of Ice and Fire audiobooks and played one of the pyromancers in the show. Sadly, he passed away in 2017, so he won't be reading the last two books, if they ever come out. Frankly, I've given up hope on that. In public, Richard presents a joking and light-hearted exterior, while his true self is cold and cynical. This is best shown in the scene with Hastings, where he leads him into a false sense of security, as if he doesn't really mean to behead him. If she has done this thing, my gracious lord. If! <laughs> God protector of this damned instrument. <laughs> Don't tell me of it. <laughs> Thou art a traitor. <laughs> Off with his head. Uh, by St. Paul, I will not dine today, I swear, until I see the same. Some see it done. <laughs> but then... <laughs> Keener viewers will notice that Stanley is referred to as Darby, though he wasn't given this title until after Bosworth Field. Once King, Richard's paranoia over losing what he has taken is demonstrated by his obsessive clinging to his crown. As long as he's holding on to it, no one can take it away from him. During the ghost sequence, Richard is sort of awake but lying face down, as disembodied heads fade in and out, telling him to despair and die. It honestly reminds me of sleep paralysis. When Richard wakes, the crown is framed in front of him like a cage. The thing he wants most is what will entrap him to his fate. The final confrontation between him and Richmond is set in mist with intrusive chiming underscoring the scene. Richard goes down fighting but screaming as Richmond barely manages to get the upper hand on him. The series can be a little tough to get through sometimes due to its slow pace, but it's a long hidden gem that all Shakespeare fans should look out for. Serian Home is absolutely an underrated Richard. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. You may be a little peeved to see that I haven't included any versions that were actually in the theatre. The problem is, I can't make my judgement on them because I haven't seen them. However, I did see one stage iteration, and this was at the Nottingham Playhouse in 2013. At least I think it was 2013. I'm trying to remember this performance as best I can. Ian Bartholomew's Richard reminded me of Keith Allen in that BBC drama about Robin Hood. Anyone remember that show? Richard Armitage was the best thing about it. This one was set in the modern day, and for the performance I was watching, they had to switch around the cast, because one actor was injured in the previous night's performance, during the Battle of Bosworth sequence. So the injured actor was playing Clarence that night instead, and he was walking around on crutches. Thematically, that kind of worked, as it had an air of Richard kicking his brother while he was down. The set had two functions. In order to change sets between scenes, they had a huge metal-looking partition come down, with doors built in and text from the play painted upon it. Whenever a character was executed, it would land with a cutting sound like a guillotine. Unlike every other version seen thus far, Anne Neville appeared to have actually heard Richard when he was telling Catesby that she was sick and liked to die. It just makes me wonder why she didn't do anything about it then. 
In the scene following Hastings' execution, where Richard and Buckingham talk with the Lord Mayor of London, they had Hastings' head in a Ziploc bag. Richard stabbed his dagger into it, but when he went to pull it out, it had clearly got stuck, and the audience laughed a bit as he struggled to pull it out. They made full use of the house as well. Richard entered for the first time by walking through the audience and onto the stage, while the court were partying and shut the doors, leaving him in isolation. Meanwhile, other actors often came and went by going through the house. Much like with Sir Ian McKellen, the Battle of Bosworth played out like a gunfight, but was set in a forest instead of Battersea Power Station. And that's pretty much all I can remember about this one. I thought it was okay, though at that time I was kind of sick of seeing Shakespeare plays adapted into modern day, because I thought that was lazy and I just thought, someone have more fun with these. You gotta understand, I've seen a lot of Shakespeare plays actually in the theatre and there are so many that just added, that just put it in modern day and it's just like, guys, be more creative, please. I do hope I can make more videos like this, much like with adapting history for visual medium, adapting literature has no end of possibilities. Each adaptation I have covered looks at different settings, has unique creative restraints that they work with, and no two adaptations of Richard III are the same, neither are the performances. Most of all, when it comes to Shakespeare, we have to be willing to break his works apart and put them back together again, to create different visions every time. I wanted to talk further about the influence of the play, but looking at this word count, I think I will have to save that for Richard's final video after the rankings. To be honest, it will fit there too, as I can explore how the play's influence on popular culture overshadowed the real person, and the inherent ableism that can be found in the play and its historical influences. Since this script is at 7,000 words, I think we'd best leave the Shakespearean element to rest for now and explore the non-Shakespearean interpretations of Richard. If I'm lucky, that video will be ready for release before Halloween. It would fit. I am going to cover a couple of horror movies. Right, we'll make this outro nice and quick. Thank you so much to my patrons who have been supporting this channel and I would not be able to make these videos without their support. By signing up to support the channel, you not only help me, but you can also get some benefits like your name in the credits, like these lovely people here, as well as access to a Discord where you find out how I'm doing with my videos more immediately than finding out through YouTube. You can also get early access to scripts and videos before they're released on YouTube. And the top tier patrons, the King and Queen patrons, get a shout out in the credits. Thank you so much, Alison Cuff, Anna from Gustine, Annalise Barnett, Jill My Nero, Larissa and Leslie Williams. And yeah, I really do hope I can make more videos like these. I'm not sure I'll be able to make a Christmas carol one by Christmas, depending on what happens in the next few months, because anything could happen really. But I would like to do a Romeo and Juliet one for Valentine's Day, so... Let me know you want to see more of these videos by sharing this video around, subscribing, liking it, boost it up in the algorithm, get tons of people to watch this. I would be so grateful to you. Right, yes. So other than that, we'll move on to the Richard III rankings, non-Shakespeare edition.